whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God alone I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Preterist Apologetics with Mike Sullivan and Don Preston. It's good to be back with you. Mike and I both uh, were distracted, let's say, last week, weren't able to be with you. It's good to be back. We're going to we're going to do something slightly different than what uh, we had planned, and we're, we're going to get back to Deuteronomy 32, that's for sure. But um, Dr. Michael Brown recently had some things to say and some comments about uh, Dr. Tobias Singer, a Jewish apologist who kind of has this, uh, uh, how should I say this, the shtick? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, to me, that, that's about the way it is. You know, he's got this canned presentation of stuff that he presents and claims that no Christian can answer it. And yet, <clears throat> interestingly enough, He's been challenged to, to debate Mike Sullivan. He's been de- challenged to debate Don Preston. And what do you know? He wouldn't debate us. Well, so what's interesting here is that Dr. Brown took it upon, him to, upon himself to refute uh, Rabbi Singer on Daniel 9 and Psalms 22. Now, in my debate and with Michael's uh, debate with Dr. Brown, we both use Daniel chapter nine because Dr. Brown admits that Daniel nine was fulfilled no later than AD 70 period end of story. And I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, that just puts you in the full preterist camp, whether you want to admit that or not. It's, it's one of those, (laughs) I mean, when you, when you carefully analyze the six constituent elements of Daniel 9, verse 24, and you admit they were all fulfilled by AD 70, you've only got one recourse. You've got to prove that not one of the constituent elements up, up, can beyond or can go beyond AD 70. You've got to prove that one of them can, but you've already admitted that they were all fulfilled before AD 70. So Dr. Michael Brown, in admitting that Daniel 9 was fulfilled no later than AD 70, has really given up the farm. So Mike has uh, Mike has been listening to Dr. Brown's analysis, his refutation of, of Rabbi Singer on Daniel 9 and Psalms chapter 22. He's going to kind of lead us down the path of some of the things that Dr. Brown said that have a tendency to come right back into his own lap. So Mike, why don't you carry it away? Amen. Well, you know, the beginning of this video, he talks about how he debated Rabbi Toby Singer twice and that he just, Singer just will not debate him anymore. All right. And he's implying that, um, and even in this video, he implies that Singer is deceptive um, and is a coward. And therefore, that's why he won't debate Michael Brown anymore. Now, Don and I have both debated Michael Brown. I've had one debate with him. Don has had two. Now we were supposed to have a follow-up debate on Zionism. Okay. And uh, the way Dr. Brown backed out of that is he said, well, you were kind of mean to me. And I was like, (laughs) "What, what are you talking about? Now it wasn't in the debate because I mean, I was, I was actually too nice. Yes, you were. Yeah. Um, so I, I said, like, what are you talking about? And he said, well, you know, you wrote this thing about me being, you know, claiming to be a false prophet and I didn't apologize. Now, I was going off of an article and it's even in his book. Um, Michael Brown was caught making a false prophecy. He, remember, he's a charismatic. And yes. that's what I was debating him about. Yes. And um, he made some kind of false prophecy about Israel and what would happen. And he was caught. and. He gave a very um, shallow apology that didn't really seem like an apology. And a lot of people picked up on that. 
And when I read it, I agreed with the other people like this really isn't an apology. I mean, this is this is horrible. He caught he was caught point blank, making a false prophecy. And of course, Don, that gets us into the realm of can New Testament prophets be wrong? Right. Um, which is something that Michael Brown has avoided a lot. But in his book, he had Sam Storms uh, defend that position, which is defenseless. So anyway, um, I, I'm just kind of shocked at, at first because he's <laughs> he's saying no one's going to debate him. So therefore, they're cowards. And here, Don and I have wanted to continue a dialogue and a debate with him, but he won't debate us. Well, yeah, let uh, me pick up on that, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, after my first, second debate with him, I followed up immediately with another challenge because the issue of the Messianic temple had come up. Mm -hmm. And so I issued a challenge and I said, Dr. Brown, let's debate the Messianic temple because in my second debate, especially I had made several points on the Messianic temple, which quite frankly, just blew him away. He had no response whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you could see visually that he was unprepared for what I had to say. Yeah. So I, I really, really wanted to press that issue home. And so when I issued the follow-up challenge for a third debate, he said, no, uh, as a matter of fact, you're a heretic, therefore I won't debate you. <laughs> uh, he's he's uh, debated Unitarians, he's debated Muslims, he's debated uh, all kinds of heretics. I guess, oh, yeah. uh, I guess we're the only kind of heretics that make too much sense. <laughs> Well, let me um, let me read you and for the folks, because we've referenced it, but I, I haven't referenced it from the from his book. This is from his Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, Volume Three, which is a really good set. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, he's a scholar. He does a he does a lot of good stuff. You can get a lot of good things from this, but uh, so much is bad, too, though. Um, on Daniel nine, the 70 weeks, he says this. Um, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering, meaning by his once and for all atoning death on the cross. But the second half of the week did not unfold for almost 40 more years, specifically from AD 67 to 70, as the text states. And on a wing of the temple, he, meaning the Roman general Titus, will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed in, is poured out upon him. He says, I believe it is best to understand all, all of the events of the 70th week as referring to the destruction of the temple under Titus. That's very specific. There's no ambiguity at all in that statement. Later on, uh, when, let's see, when we major on the majors, the minors become less important. That's not. And then on page 107, he says, in reviewing the overall chronology of the of 490 years, we should consider the possibility that there are some minor gaps between the specific periods mentioned, meaning that the 490 year period might not be totally consecutive. Despite these words of caution, however, we can safely identify the boundaries of the fulfillment of this prophecy beginning somewhere in 536 BC and ending in 70 AD with the major events, that is the six events, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, taking place over the course of the 490 years. Now, I brought this up in the debate because obviously, and, and we'll get to it, I don't know if we'll get to it tonight, but we'll probably get it to next show. You know, Daniel 9.24 is really specific to, to <laughs> seal up vision and, and the office of prophet through the fulfillment of, of all prophecy, uh, specifically of the 490 years, because that in a nutshell is the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecy. And when that would be fulfilled is when the office of prophet would stop, would cease. Okay. This is a very important text. And uh, so I brought this up and I brought up a chart on on how they understood through Q, 11 Q Melchizedek, the Dead Sea Scrolls, that Messiah would show up in the 10th Jubilee. Now, he didn't touch it. He uh, honestly, he had no response to it. All he said is you misrepresented what I believe 
about the second <laughs> week. He didn't respond to my argument. But now I want you to listen to what he says and what specifically what he doesn't say about that particular issue. Here it goes. Traditions inside and outside what becomes rabbinic Judaism that make reference to this text as well. And this is fairly well known. It doesn't take you, you research it online and get some good academic papers that are available online. That Which go I through sent this him. And, and how things were looked at chronologically. But there was a sense. Here it goes. Others, <clears throat> others have written about it as well. There was a sense of living in this time, this fullness of time, this messianic era. In fact, from what we understand, the the Essenes at Qumran had calculated things using the seventy weeks and and were expecting the revelation of Messiah, which would have been oh thirty or so years before thirty five years before Jesus was crucified. The point the point is though, that Jesus refers to this and points to this very passage. Telling us to take notes. Okay, so notice that he doesn't state what he's referring to. It's 11Q Melchizedek. In that passage, the author cites Isaiah 61, Daniel 9, 24 through 27, uh, Psalms 82, Psalm 61, a bunch of a bunch of passages. And they believed that the Messiah, when he came in that 10th Jubilee, he had to fulfill everything. He had to fill the, fulfill the Day of Atonement. He had to gather his people, the eschatological gathering, and he would judge the watchers and Satan. The, that is the consummation, the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecy is how they understood Daniel 70 weeks. And Michael is being deceptive. Now he's pointing out Tobias Singer's deception and I'm pointing out Michael Brown's deception. <laughs> He's not telling you where it is because if you go there and you look at it, you'll see what I did in my debate. I said, Mike, there's no first coming of Christ and 2000 later, 2000 years later, he comes and fulfills the 70 weeks. It has to be fulfilled when the people in the city are judged. And 11Q Melchizedek, this is how first century Jews understood this passage. And you're interpreting it in a totally different way. Not only that, but all of these rabbinic traditions that when Messiah was cut off, the resurrection would take place 40 years later. And that there's this 40 year period, second exodus between their old covenant age and the arrival of the new covenant age. So there's all these traditions and exegesis of first century Judaism that Michael Brown ignores pretends is not there because he knows it points to full preterism so that's that's the first issue issue now i want to bring up something in don's debate in don's debate with michael brown he debated romans 11 all israel will be saved and then he followed up a second debate because michael brown got the times of the gentiles so wrong in luke <laughs> 21 that they had to deal with that but in Don's first debate, it was a masterful debate. It was basically taken from his book um, uh, on uh, Elijah, you know. Solomon. Elijah has come. Yeah. Yes. And Don was pointing out all of these, developing all of the Old Testament passages that Paul is using to make his case in Romans, you know, basically 9 through 11. Yeah. And every time Don would go to the past, the Old Testament passage and develop it, Michael would just cry foul. Oh, well, you know, you can't take, you know, the entire psalm or or the entire chapter of Isaiah or or go too much beyond in Deuteronomy 32. You, you can't do that. All right. Now, now Michael is having issue now with Tovia Singer in Psalm 22. All right. And let's look at how. Uh, Dr. Brown responds to him. Let's see. It's at 940. Humanity has invented oh, a washing gonna... machine, a broom, a vacuum cleaner, and still no tool to clean up. Before I even go into this, why isn't this quoted in the Christian Bible? That means if first century Christians believed that it's said, in, that means if we're lying, and the first followers of Yeshua, okay, I play by the rules, 
believe that said they pierced my hands and my feet. You have to believe that they didn't think that was an important enough verse to quote. Ah, actually, very surprising again. Yeshua himself hanging on the cross, quotes from Psalm 22, 1, drawing our attention to the entire Psalm. That's one reason to <laughs> draw our attention to the Psalm. And then other specific instances from the Psalms, how the mockers mock him using the language of Psalm 22, how they, they part his garments among them using what? a very yep. specific description in Psalm Watch 22. This show go again. That's enough to draw our attention. And by the way, Here we the go. New Testament makes reference to Isaiah 53 in a number of different ways clearly telling us it's messianic clearly telling us to look at it but it doesn't right. quote every key verse there you go you know he was wounded for our transgressions doesn't quote all of that he doesn't relevant quote. section <laughs> here and there oh. that happens with other psalms as well does it and, and other yeah yeah you mean like the ones don brought us <laughs> passage as a whole or to the chapter as a whole see that's what the new testament does exactly psalm 22 is <laughs> clearly featured in the new i mean i just I saw that <laughs> I saw that Don and I was driving and I'm like, oh, Don's gotta hear this. He's gonna- Oh my goodness. That that is uh that is absolutely priceless. So in other words, uh Tobias Singer doesn't understand that when the New Testament writers are quoting from an old testament text that you you gotta go back and look at the whole context. But when Don Preston shows how Paul quoted from an Old Testament passage. And when you go to that Old Testament context, that it blows Dr. Brown out of the water, then Don Preston is misusing scripture. Right. Oh, wow. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's really rich. That's really rich. That was. And, you know, it, it's the irony not only is just the inconsistent hermeneutic, but the fact that he's willing to say, look, man, Tovia Singer, he's just deceptive. And I'm like, well, and, you know, the funny thing is, is he will say to Tovia Singer and these other Jews, he'll say, if Messiah didn't arrive before the second temple was was judged, according to the Daniel 70 weeks and Malachi 3, then Messiah will never show up. All right. And your religion is false. And my response to to Michael is, no, that's not what that's not what those texts say. Those texts say if Messiah didn't come upon the clouds in judgment to (laughs) judge the temple and bring salvation, then you have no religion. The the Bible is, is false at that point. If he did not keep his word. And that's something that Michael Brown just refuses to to connect in his brain. Well, that's interesting to me on on many, many levels. And I want to make two observations here. Uh, You you made uh, point that in the Essene community, there was absolutely no misunderstanding about, and there is no misunderstanding in the scholarly sources about what their expectation was. They believed with all of their heart, they were fervent in their expectation that they were the last days, the last days community. Generation. Yeah, generation. That is exactly right. Uh, I think it was uh, Jay Barton um, boy, uh, I haven't looked at his book in, in a good little while entitled last day's communities. And he goes back and examines the beliefs of the Essenes showing just like you did so well there that when you examine those, uh, Essene writings, boy, they were on the tiptoe of expectation. Oh, yeah. And by the way, they believed that they themselves, that that community that was alive in the first century, they believed that they were the chosen people for God's royal, holy army to defeat the Romans. The sons of light. The sons of light. And so anyone suggesting that they had uh, an extended or protracted eschatological panoramic view of history is simply misrepresenting the facts. Uh, and by the way, this can be documented in any number of ways. And in my uh, in my second response uh, to Elton Holland, which I posted the very first installment of that response on my website today, by the way, mm-hmm. uh, and on a- academia.edu. But in that, I develop <clears> that <throat> there is a marked contrast between the uh, expectation, the eschatological expectation of the Essenes and the first century Jews 
and Jesus in his eschatological perspective. Now, there's a lot that could be unpacked on that, but the point I'm making is that what Michael brought out just a few moments ago is they believed, and according to their calculations, they were the final generation. There were no eschatological expectations beyond that generation. Period. End of story. And that's huge. They were interpreting Daniel the same way we are interpreting, interpreting Daniel. They also believed that the war of Gog and Magog would be between apostate Jews in Jerusalem with Rome. Yes. That was the end time battle. And, and they were the terminal generation. And this is everything that we see in Jesus's eschatology and the eschatology of the New Testament. That, and that's a point that I make in this article that I referred to, which the particular installment of that is won't be posted for probably four or five weeks now. But that, that's the point that I make, that the Jews, including the Essenes, the Pharisees, what have you, had a timeline narrative of events of the last days. I mean, they believed in the coming of Elijah. They believed in the coming of the teacher of righteousness, obviously. Uh, they believed in the great tribulation of which they were to be a part, to be God's instruments during that uh, great tribulation. But that great tribulation would bring about the resurrection and the kingdom of God. And again, they were to be God's royal, holy army to defeat the Romans and to establish holiness in Jerusalem, uh, to restore, to purify Jerusalem itself, to restore and to purify the temple itself. Now, when you follow Jesus in his narrative, guess what? Jesus talked about the coming of Elijah. He talked about what? Familial strife, which would be a part of Elijah's role uh, to set right the father and the mother with the children, et cetera, et cetera. Malachi chapter four. But the great tribulation leading to directly before, uh, immediately before, as a matter of fact, the resurrection. So while, while the understanding of the nature of the kingdom, for instance, was radically different between the Essenes, the Jews, the Pharisees, and Jesus, the nature of it, was totally different. The timeline was identical. And I, I developed that, by the way, in my book, uh, The Resurrection of Daniel, Chapter 12, too, uh, Fulfilled Our Future, because I think it's important for us to understand how Jesus was following well-accepted Jewish thought in regard to the timeline. Here are the Essenes. The time is at hand. This is the terminal generation. Uh, it's not going beyond this, et cetera, et cetera. The kingdom of heaven is at hand and Jesus is going, you're exactly right. But guess what? The kingdom of heaven is in your midst or within you, whichever translation or significance you, you'd like to give to that. But Jesus said, <laughs> you know, if I, by the finger of God, do cast out demons, then surely the kingdom of God is in your midst. It's already here. So we can say that the timeline, the the, um, the time expectation was the same. Absolutely. But when it came to the nature of fulfillment, I'm not going to make this a complete statement, but they most of them missed the nature of fulfillment. Oh, no now, doubt. Now, it seems they did have a concept, Don, and you know, Don, Tom Holland brings this out as well, yep. that they their community were the messianic temple. Yes. Right? So they would apparently interpret Ezekiel the same way the Apostle Paul did in 2 Corinthians 6.16 when he says, you are the temple, he's quoting Ezekiel. There was kind of a mixed bag in that regard. Right. right. Uh, there were some who did. Right. Maybe like almost 100% in sync with the New Testament authors on timing. Yep. But when it came to nature of fulfillment, that's where we have the mixed bag. Yes. And Jesus is ex exegeting the kingdom of Daniel too, and they're not getting it. Yeah. Exactly right. By the way, I, I've got to point this out because this is, this is, shall we say, a discovery that I made just recently uh, in my research for my response to uh, Mr. Holland. And it came from this book. Now, that, uh, Mike, you do this. I know you do. Uh, you buy books. They kind of sit on your shelf. You don't get a chance to read them right. uh, when you would really like to. 
maybe you glance through them and a, and a thought kind of lodges in your head, you know, and then later on your research in your research, you're going, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's what I did with this. Uh, Jesus and Israel's traditions and judgment traditions of judgment and restoration. This is by Stephen Bryant. Hmm. Well, in my response to Mr. Hall, and I was pointing out this disparity uh, and disjunction between the Essenes and Jewish expectation concerning the nature of the kingdom, because in, in his response to my response, he had consulted with Dale Allison Jr. And Dale Allison Jr. is a very noted scholar. I've had, I've had the privilege of corresponding with him a, a good little bit down through the ages. Uh, through the through time, but he consulted with Dale Allison, and Dale Allison made the following argument: Well, uh, <clears throat> the Essenes and the Jews expected a literal physical restoration of all twelve tribes to the land. Jesus was a Jew; he had the, therefore the same physical, materialistic, nationalistic expectation. And what Steve Bryan does in this book, and it, it's a masterful stroke. And like I said, it, it's literally one of those type of things. And it's found on page 172 and following. He, he makes note of the fact. Well, here's the fact. Oops. <laughs> oh, well. In Jewish expectation. Now, there were some voices, uh, a few voices that dis differed. But the mainline Jewish thought was that when Israel was restored to the lands, to the land, all 12 tribes in the Messianic kingdom, the Samaritans had to be kicked out of the kingdom. They were considered un or impure. They were not Jews. They had no right to the land. They had no right to the promises of God. Well, again, there's some voices, Jewish voices, that, that would actually say, oh, yeah, the Samaritans are going to be included. That's not the dominant view, according to Steve Bryan. So here's the, here's the key. If it was true, and this is, applies especially to the Essene community at this particular point in our discussion. So if the Essenes accepted the dominant view that when the kingdom would be established, the Samaritans would be booted out. In fact, the Samaritans would be annihilated in some of the dominant strains of Messianic expectation of the Jews. How does that fit with Jesus's view of the kingdom? Oh, let's see here. The story of the good Samaritan Holy cow, that flew in the face <laughs> of everything that the good righteous rabbis believed about the Samaritans. A Samaritan would never, ever, ever be more righteous than even the worst of the Jews. How does that fit in with the 10 lepers in which Jesus heals 10 lepers and says, go show yourself to the priest? And as they, as they depart, only one returned to thank Jesus. Guess who he was? Oh, he's a Samaritan. <laughs> And then and, the big one, John 4. I, I, that's exactly where I was headed. John chapter 4. Here Jesus at Jacob's well says to a Samaritan woman, give me, give me to drink. And the woman, you know, uh, wouldn't you have loved to see the woman's facial expression? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How is it that you, being a Jewish man, ask of me, a Samaritan woman, for drink? The Jews have no recourse with the Samaritans and Jesus's acceptance of that woman what was a, a, an incredible challenge to the dominant view of the day against the Samaritans and I love Luke chapter 9 as Jesus was going to travel to Galilee they come to a city of the Samaritans and when the city and when the Samaritans realized that Jesus and his party were Jews, they wouldn't allow them to come through the city. And John, oh, you know, the great apostle of love, kindness and gentility, says, Lord, you want us to call fire down from heaven and consume them? <laughs> That's the good Jewish mentality. Because after all, what's, what is the message of Jesus? The kingdom of heaven is drawn near. The time is fulfilled. So, John is expressing real good <laughs> Jewish ideas of, since, after all, the kingdom is at hand. And Lord, look at how the Samaritans are treating you. So let's just destroy them now. And Jesus says, good grief, John. 
you know, you, you just don't get it. Yeah. That's not the right thing. So this, this creates a huge disparity between Jesus's kingdom expectation and what happened in Acts chapter eight, which reflects Jesus's ministry, of course, it's after he ascended. But in Acts chapter one, Jesus said the gospel was to be preached in Jerusalem and Judea and what? And Samaria. Samaria. Well, according to good Jewish thought, the, the message of the kingdom for the Samaritans was you guys better get ready to evacuate <laughs> because doom is coming on you. Well, instead, here's Philip going down to Samaria and preaching the kingdom. And they accepted it with gladness and joy. And Philip worked many miracles among them. But when the elders and the apostles back at Jerusalem heard that the Samaritans has accepted the gospel, they sent Peter and John down there to lay hands on them and, impart, and to impart gifts unto them. Now, look, the imparting of hands meant acceptance into full fellowship. It meant equality. The soul of the charismatic gifts meant equality in Christ. Jew, Samaritan, equal in Christ. In what, in regard to what? The kingdom of God. Because that was the message that Philip preached. So this, this shows that the Essene community's attitude about the kingdom and the nature of the kingdom, 180 degrees out, 180 degrees out, Jesus accepted the Samaritans. He and his followers preached the kingdom of acceptance of the Samaritans when they when the kingdom was established. This yeah. is this is such cool stuff. <laughs> you know, another really cool thing in the Dead Sea Scrolls, at least a hundred to two hundred years before Christ, they the rabbis were talking about Jonah, and they were saying Jonah is a suffering prophet. He died and he rose and he's, and they said, Messiah ben Joseph, who comes from the line of Ephraim, Samaritans. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> they had that expectation of Messiah. They called him Tahib. He would be the restorer. And that's why at the well, I am the restorer. I'm the living water. I'm the one that yep, yep. The, you're Tahib. <clears throat> and they had this tradition and they, they actually talked about Jonah being a sign of the Messiah that would come from uh, Ephraim, Joseph's line, that he would die and he would rise again. And so when Jesus says, I'm going to give you the sign of Jonah, they already, they already, it was already in their head. Yeah. Oh, you're saying that your Messiah been Joseph? You're going to die and rise? And that's right. And, that's show, right. and show grace to the Gentiles, just like Jonah did. Just like Jonah did. God, God <clears> through <throat> Jonah. But yeah, so th this is really cool stuff. Anyway, um, let's, uh, unless you, if you got some more, but. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, we could, we could just go on and on about that, but it, it shows that what the German scholars called the Zetz in Leben, understanding the, the world and the life situation uh, of the culture of Jesus's time. And, and I got to say this, <clears throat> well, I certainly don't agree with every single thing uh, that N.T. Wright teaches. Okay. That's, th that's not the point he, but he is so masterful at sharing with his audience what the Jewish culture of the day was teaching of how so many things that when we read the New Testament, we'll read, pardon me, we'll read about things that were on Jesus's lip, lips, pardon me, and we might just gloss over it without realizing that the things that Jesus was saying were citations of common expectations of the day related to kingdom expectation and Jesus would take that expectation, and just like you were pointing out in regard to Noah, uh, Jonah, the sign of Noah, they had an expectation in those days and at that time, <clears throat> in that generation about Jonah, the sign of Jonah, and Jesus is saying, I am that sign. 
I'm the suffering, I'm the dying, and I'm the rising Messiah, Ben Joseph. And that's what he said. Yeah. This is the sign. I'm going to I'm gonna rise in three days. Just and, like and, I rose out of the fish. And without understanding that background, mm -hmm. what, what, when we read, when Jesus, when we read Jesus saying, uh, and they say, well, what sign will you give us? And he says, oh, oh, I'll show you the sign of Jonah. Well, okay, we, <laughs> <laughs> we read that, <clears throat> and there's a huge gap in our appreciation of what a powerful statement that is, or I should say, what a powerful statement it was in that culture, in that time, in the common understanding of the people. Yeah. Bingo, yeah, we, oh, sign of Jonah, whoa, what is this guy claiming? Exactly. Oh, he's Messiah. And then he's going to the son of man. He's like, oh, wow. He's the cloud rider. <laughs> he's the cloud rider. Blowing their minds. Yes. You know, and it's just like those statements are just like so many statements in the Tanakh. I've said this many, many, many times. There's so many statements in the Old Testament that we read being acclimated or enculturated, if you please, without any understanding without a proper comprehensive understanding of the temple, the temple culture, the temple language, the temple practices. Yet in the Old Testament, when it would predict the Messianic temple, the Old Testament would, would make so many statements of what it would be like in that Messianic temple. And we today, we're so used to saying, well, the church is the temple of God. Well, yeah, yeah, I'll see how that fits. But those statements are totally mind-blowing to the ancient Jews who knew only the Old Testament temple practices, which stood at 180-degree variance from what, the from what the prophetic text was saying was going to be. Oh, you mean to tell me, Malachi chapter 1, verse 13, <clears throat> that when the Messiah comes, that in those last days, from the rising of the sun to the setting, sacrifice will be offered in any place and all place to my name? No, 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 no. Yeah. There's something wrong here. Only at Jerusalem can sacrifices be offered. So Jesus may well have had Malachi chapter 1, 13 in mind, as well as obviously some other Old Testament passages. But nonetheless, he certainly could have had Malachi chapter one in mind when he said, woman, believe me, the time is coming, the hour is coming in which neither in this mountain, Gerizim, nor in Jerusalem will men worship God. S say what? <laughs> that was staggeringly challenging. And yeah. we read it, we'll say, yeah, of course, yeah, you know, we, we know all about that. They didn't. They did not comprehend it. And that's why Jesus was such an offense to both Jew and Samaritan in so many of his teachings. It's a challenge for us today to get back into that world. And again, that's why I particularly like N.T. Wright, because he brings that world to life and sheds light on Jesus's teaching through the prism of their culture and their practices. Beautiful stuff. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. I'm going to let my dog out of my office because she's spazzing, and then we'll get right into it. <laughs> okay, well, while, while Mike takes care of the spastic dog here. <laughs> but, but folks, do yourself a favor and get some of N.T. Wright's uh, writings. I, I particularly like Jesus and the Victory of God. I think it's one of his more easily read books, and in it, he, he brings out so many of these cultural uh practices, cultural idioms, cultural concepts, uh, and relates them to Jesus and his ministry and his message. And I mean, it, it really will. <clears throat> it will expand your horizons. It will truly expand your horizons. Okay, now then, Mike. All right, just a review, guys. Why are we spending time on Daniel's 70 weeks? Remember, this is a study that's that kind of started in Deuteronomy 32, which kind of was reviewing Michael Brown's debate with Steve Gregg on, on the role of modern Israel. Is modern Israel fulfillment of prophecy or not? So when we're in Daniel 32, 
at verse 35 in the Septuagint, we read that at the appointed time, Kairos, when Israel would slip, she would have her final end, and that end would be near in Israel's last days at this appointed time. And so Don and I are kind of tracking Deuteronomy 32 through the Old Testament. We started with Isaiah, and now we're kind of spending some time in Daniel because Daniel talks about Kairos too, the appointed time, and we'll see it here in, in Romans 13 in just a bit. And so that's why we're developing this a little bit, okay? And we've already developed the first of six soteriological and eschatological events that are listed. And that was fill up the transgression. So we spent a lot of time on that. Go back to the previous videos if you can. But the second one here, Don, is to put, put an end to sin. So Jesus talked about this in the Olivet Discourse. Now, if you don't divide up the Olivet Discourse, or even if you uh, even if you do, you're going to have some a hard time. I take the redemption in the Olivet Discourse. Look up, lift up your head, for your redemption is drawing near. I take that as the redemption of the body, apakdekamai. They're on tiptoes of expectation with outstretched neck. Same concept that Jesus is talking about, looking up, for your redemption draws nigh. And so in the Olivet Discourse, we learn that at the sound of the trumpet, which that's forgiveness of sin, and you, you can take away the, uh, the feast motif on that in a second. We have the gathering in, all right, Feast of Tabernacles, all right, and the kingdom is inherited at the coming of the Son of Man in that contemporary generation. Now, when you don't divide Matthew 24 and 25, you see at the coming of the Son of Man, Matthew 25, 31, which Doug Wilson takes as AD 70, which um, Keith Matheson takes as AD 70. And if you do, you have to take that all the way to verse 46. That's right. And when we do that, we have the judgment of uh, the devil and the angels, and we have the rewarding, which would be the resurrection, of eternal life. And that ultimately is the taking away of sin. And we're talking about positional truth here of what God does for his people. Amen. Uh, everything you said there, I, I agree with 100%. <clears throat> and let's just face it. If, as the two examples that you gave, Matheson and others, there are, there are other partial predators who accept the fact that the entirety of the Olivet Discourse is Matthew 24 and 25 and applied it AD 70. Now, Gary DeMar kind of equivocates on verse 31 to 46 by saying, well, that judgment is still ongoing today. Well, I take that judgment as the judgment of the old covenant world. Right. And <clears throat> I do not take that as an ongoing judgment. If it's an ongoing judgment, now you might say that the results of that one singular uh, punctiliar judgment of the old covenant world has ongoing implications uh, and applications, but not fulfillments. Because the, the judgment and the harvest, according to Matthew chapter 13, was to be at the end of the age, not going on through the unending age. And so I think that's very important. I think I think it's really critical to understand the concept that we're talking about the judgment. We're talking about the harvest. We are talking about the judgment and the harvest of the old covenant age at the end of that age. <clears throat> but on Facebook, I've been having this roundy round discussion uh, with a guy. Number one, he condemns men like Mike and me because we use the term mosaic age or new covenant age or church age or gospel age. And he condemns us because, oh, those terms are not found in the Bible. So we should not use such terms. So what does he do? He uses the term messianic age. Well, I've challenged him over and over and over and over again. Show us the term messianic age. Okay. If, you know, you might have a point. You don't, but you might have a point, at least a little better point, if you could find the term messianic age. So when I challenge him on that, he just completely, totally drops the ball and, and goes away. But he keeps talking about the end of the current messianic Christian church age. 
And my simple question to him has, has been, <clears throat> I have challenged him to give an answer to this, no less than 10 times down through the past couple of years. Tell us how the endless, endless Christian age, Messianic age, has no end. Show us how that has an end. Hebrews chapter 12, 25 and following. <clears throat> Pardon me. The writer discusses how the earth was shaken at Mount Sinai in the giving of the law. And he says, and now yet once more, I shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. And this, this saying, yet once more, signifies the removing of, the, of those things that are shaken. <clears throat> The things that were shaken was the earth, and that was the old covenant, heaven and earth, that was being shaken at that time, so that that which cannot be moved might remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. So notice he is talking about the removal of the old covenant world. It would cease to function as it was established. Therefore, it was removed. <clears throat> There's no more temple. There's no more priesthood. There's no more sacrifices. For all practical purposes, somebody may jump on me for saying this, but there's really honestly no more Old Covenant Jerusalem. The Jerusalem that is there today is not Old Covenant Jerusalem. It is Talmudic right. Jerusalem. Yeah. So it's Rothschild Jerusalem. Rothschild, Jerusalem, that's a good way to put it. So <clears throat> that old covenant kingdom was removed forever <clears throat> and no longer functions, no longer can function in the way that it was established. And the writer says, well, that's being shaken so that the kingdom, which cannot ever be shaken, might remain. Since we are receiving, that's in a present participial form there in Hebrews chapter 12, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us serve God with reverence and fear. Okay, since the old covenant kingdom was removed by causing it to cease to function as it was established, and since the new covenant kingdom, which was being established at that very time, could never be moved, then that means the church will never cease to function as it was established and intended to function in its perfected form. Now, there were some temporary forms that were present. We understand that, but that's not the point. The church, as the body of Christ, functioning as an evangelizing, God-glorifying, God-glorifying uh, God through Christ Jesus throughout all ages, age without end. And as G.K. Beale says, commenting on Ephesians chapter 3, 20 and 21, that I just cited there, <clears throat> G.K. Beale says that the form of the Greek expression there is the strongest expression in the Greek. Aeon, aeon, ton, aeon, aeon. Strongest Greek expression for endlessness to be found in the Greek. So how long is God glorified in the church. And Paul's not talking about the church removed from earth in a rapture. He is not talking about the church after the end of time. He is talking about the church established on earth among men to give glory to God. By preaching, as he expresses it in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8, to make manifold, <clears> or <throat> manifest, excuse me, the manifold wisdom of God. And the Greek of that text is, can be translated as, or rendered as the many splendored wisdom of God. That's the unending task of the church. And it is an unending task to make that wisdom known to all the all nations, as well as <clears throat> to the principalities and the powers in the heavenlies. That's what the church on earth does. It manifests the glory of God, hmm. even in the heavenlies. That's that's some incredible stuff. It really, really is some, some incredible stuff. So when we talk about uh, Christ's work, and we talk about this unending nature of Christ's work, it becomes incumbent upon us that we show, number one, <clears throat> 
the dispensational view, the churches are going to be raptured off the off of the earth and no longer function on the earth. I'm sorry, of his rule and of, of, of his reign, that's on the throne of David, that's in the kingdom, where he was seated at the right hand of the throne on high, Acts chapter 2, 29 and following, of his rule and of his reign, there shall be no end. So uh, I think I got sidetracked there just a little bit, maybe. I, I think so. I was like, how does it, what is it? <laughs> end of sin. <laughs> I know, I know. <clears throat> okay. That's okay. I, I, I get carried away when I get on that particular thought because it's so beautiful. Amen. Amen. I, I, I like those rabbit trails. I always go. Like <laughs> um, because that kind of reflects some of the stuff you're reading and you, you can't help but get excited about. That's exactly know, right. Reading. Okay. So in the Oliver Discourse, we have the reception of the kingdom. The kingdom is inherited. Eternal life is given. I don't know of anyone that wouldn't say that when eternal life is given at the coming of Christ, that's not the end of sin. Um, Romans 11. And now remember what we said about Michael Brown. Yeah. Okay. You remember what he said? Oh, okay. yeah. Well, let's read Romans 11 and go back to Don's debate with him. And so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And this is the covenant from me with them. When I take away their sins. Now, where's he quoting from? <laughs> Isaiah 27. Remember, Michael Brown just got done telling us that if Jesus quotes one part of Psalm 22, we're allowed to take the entire content. He's he's drawing the reader and the listener's mind back to the entire song. And he said you have to do that with many other passages as well. Many other passages. <laughs> and here's one of them. Because he said, Isaiah, you know, 52 and 53, if one quote's there, you got to take the whole block. So why can't we do that with Isaiah 27, Don? Because this is the promise of the new covenant. And in your debate, you brought up all of these passages, Old Testament passages, that are either talking about the salvation of the remnant yep. as all Israel, with the inclusion of the Gentiles, which is Paul's entire context in Romans 9 and 11. And these Old Testament passages would talk about salvation for the remnant when Israel is judged. What do we have, Don, in the immediate context of Isaiah 27, 9 through 13, okay, that talks about the taking away of sin, the putting away of sin, but at what event? Oh, <clears throat> when I make the fortified city a ruin, when I make the altar and turn it into chalk stones, when the people whom the Lord has created, uh, Lord had created a people of no understanding, citing Deuteronomy 28, 38, or, uh, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 32, 28 verbatim. Okay. Well, the people whom he had created, that people of no understanding will no longer obtain mercy. And he says in verse nine and says, this is the fruit <clears throat> of the taking away of his sin, which is the part that Paul quotes in Romans chapter 11. How would that be done? When, pardon me, <clears throat> isn't it interesting? I made comment on this on some blog just the other day. I don't even know what blog it was, man. I, I have commented on a number of blogs over the last a couple of weeks that were attacking covenant eschatology. And of course, <clears throat> uh, some of them, you know, so many of them attacking the time statement. And this one lady particularly attacked me vehemently. And I said, well, isn't it interesting? And, and she was standing up, by the way, for Sam Frost and his quote scholarship. I said, well, isn't it interesting that the only people who are willing to stand up and honor the words of Jesus about when he would fulfill his promises are the preterist, and we are the only ones being called heretics for doing that. So I said, perhaps you ought to read the very verses that Sam Frost wants to tell you don't mean a thing. Don't read them through the prism of Sam Frost. Read them through the context of the scriptures themselves. And so I, I brought these up. Well, here's a text in Isaiah chapter 27, 9 and following. That doesn't say at hand, quickly, soon, shortly, et cetera, et cetera. This is the fruit of the taking away of, sin, of his sins when the fortified city is destroyed, when the altar is turned into chalk stone, 
when the people whom he had created no longer finds mercy because they are people of no understanding. You know, when is a pretty powerful term. It is not an at hand quickly and shortly and soon term, but it certainly is a time indicator that says the time for the taking away of Israel's sin would be when the fortified city of Jerusalem was destroyed, when the temple altar itself was destroyed and the people whom the Lord had created would be or would no longer receive mercy. Now, folks, ask yourself the question. When was the city whom the Lord and the people whom the Lord had created, when did, when did she no, no longer find mercy? When was the altar turned to chalk stone? By the way, when people try to make that reply somehow, some uh, apply somehow, some way, and they say, oh, well, th this applies to the Assyrian invasion uh, under Sennacherib. No, I'm sorry, that wasn't work. That will not work. Jerusalem was not destroyed under Sennacherib. The temple was not destroyed under Sennacherib. The altar was not turned to chalk stone. The people whom the Lord created, that is in Judea and Jerusalem, they were not completely destroyed. The Lord just delivered them miraculously in the night by destroying 185,000 of the Assyrian soldiers, you know, through the angel of death. So this is not talking about the Assyrian destruction. This is talking about a time in which Jerusalem, the temple, the altar, and the people would be utterly destroyed. Yet at that, that, at that time, this is the fruit of the taking away of their sin. Now, what would that, what would take place? Well, has he, Israel, been slain according to the number of those who slayed or killed her? Yes, in part by sending her away. It, look, folks, this is, this is so critically important. The concept <clears throat> is found throughout the Tanakh. Separation from the land was considered to be death for Israel. Israel separated from the land was considered to be in the graves. Ezekiel chapter 37, the Valley of Dry Bones, which stood up and were given life. Who are these? Oh, it's the whole house of Israel that is in captivity. That's the whole house of Israel. That's all 12 tribes. They were in the graves. But what would happen? I'll put my spirit upon them and I will raise them up. Huh. The Holy Spirit would be the agency of resurrection. What happened in Acts chapter 2? Israel began to be raised from the dead in Acts chapter 2 through the impartation and through the, through the work of the Holy Spirit on that day. So <clears throat> it's critical to understand here in Romans chapter 11, Paul is talking about all Israel shall be saved. Well, what is the salvation? It's resurrection in Isaiah chapter 27, because Isaiah chapter 27, verse 12 and 13, what is going to happen? Well, <clears throat> there shall be a time of sowing and a time of reaping, which is a reflection on the, fe <clears throat> on the feast of Sukkot, the feast of harvest, and those who, who, who are in Egypt and Assyria and in Pathros and in Cush, those who are nigh unto perishing shall be gathered at the sounding of the great trumpet. This is the salvation of the remnant. <clears throat> this is their resurrection. Why? Because these are the diaspora. These are those scattered among the nations. They're dead but they're gathered back to God in, in a covenant relationship. And this is the new covenant of Romans chapter 11, because the way God was going to forgive Israel's sin was through the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 29 to 31. And to, and to kill two birds with one stone yeah. on, on, on uh, letting kind of Michael Brown dig his own grave there. In the passage that he did not cite 11Q Melchizedek, for obvious reasons, because if people actually read it, they'd be like, wow, all redemption was supposed to be fulfilled this time. 11Q Melchizedek cites Isaiah 27. Um, so th again, they were looking for atonement. Messiah had to gather his people. This is it. Yep. 
This is the resurrection. This is the final judgment. This is the end of the old covenant age judgment. They understood Isaiah 27 the same way Paul is. And Michael Brown in the same debate, <laughs> after not only not telling you what 11 Q Melchizedek was and all the Old Testament texts that were cited for that, then he admits in the same video that we have to take the entire context of an Old Testament passage that's quoted in the New Testament. And Don just got done sharing with you that the salvation of the righteous remnant with the Gentiles would be gathered into the kingdom when Jerusalem would be judged. We have the same concept in Daniel chapter 12. Again, just like here, we don't have a time statement, but he's he's asked, when will these things take place? All of these things, the tribulation, the time of the end, uh, Kairos in the Septuagint, oh. the appointed time, the tribulation, the resurrection, all these things will take place during a three and a half year period when the shattering of the holy people takes place. The judgment of Israel in AD 70 and the temple and the desolation that would come only at that period, at the end of that age. And so we have all of this harm, beautiful harmony. It's exquisite, uh, actually. Uh, I, I got to tell you, the, when I very first discovered Isaiah chapter 27, uh, and the entire context of the little apocalypse, going back to chapter 24, of course, uh, and, and how over and over and over salvation is posited at the time of the judgment of Israel. And in, in one of my presentations uh, at the conference that's going to be in Jonesboro, Arkansas, boy, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm stoked about that. But I'm going to use the material that I use in, in my debate with Chris Date on, mm -hmm. the, on the tribulation. and what? Resurrection. Because Chris Date <clears throat> had not, not a word, not one word in response to passage after passage after passage that I adduced from the Old Testament in which the Old Testament messianic prophecies, by the way, folks, you have to understand this. These are not just some random passages. These are passages from the Old Testament that the New Testament writers draw from over and over and over again but they, they link the great tribulation with the time of the resurrection. And I'm going to be bringing out some other aspects of, of this entire thing. And I, I knew, and of course, I've been developing this concept for years and years and years. I think you and I have discussed it at different times. But I knew that when I presented that in my debate with Chris Day, I knew that he had not a clue of a hint of an idea of a suggestion of how to answer that. And so he had to finally resort to saying, I'm not going down that path to go against the, the creeds and the tradition of the church. I'm just not going down that path. Yeah, and he was just going to post a meme the whole time, which was totally exactly. shameful and immature. Well, Don, our time's up, but let's real quickly, <laughs> we'll, we'll touch on Romans 13, and then we'll kind of unpack it more at the beginning of our next show, because obviously there's so much here. Okay. And do this because you know the appointed time. Kairos, again, Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse 35 in the Septuagint, Daniel 9, 24 through 27, Kairos in the Septuagint, and in Daniel 12, yep. verse 4, Kairos, Septuagint. You know the time of the, of the resurrection. The appointed time that it is already the hour again another septuagint of daniel 12 the hour of the end here's the hour for you to wake from sleep gee that sounds like daniel 12 too to me it sure does for our salvation what salvation has he been talking about it's the salvation of all israel in chapter 11 that we're is right above this passage it is nearer now than when we believed the night of the old covenant age is far gone. And the day, that eternal day, where the light is in the new Jerusalem, Isaiah 60, all the way through 66, that day draws near. So again, this is a salvation in which there's no more sin. Christ's righteousness, his salvation is now imputed to the believer we're face to face 
He looks at us as he looks at Christ. Romans 13, 11 and 12, just like, just like Isaiah 27, just like Isaiah 59, what I started to say a few moments ago. When you see the power of these texts, it is literally beyond my ability to understand how somebody, and, and I'm not imputing anybody's honesty here. I don't mean to be disrespectful in any sense. But Mike, I am convinced that 99% of the people out there have never explored the depths of Romans chapter 11, except to hear John Hagee say, oh, it's, you know, the time of their salvation is right here. Or, you know, uh, Michael Brown or any other either premillennial or dispensational author saying, folks, we're, we're in that time. We, we know we are in that time. And we, and will pay, we will pay a radical consequence, the church will, for not doing her homework and listening to that. Amen. As that nation over there has our demise and has been sucking us dry because of these evangelicals worshiping this country over there that is destroying us, that dis that brought in the Federal Reserve and is just leeching off us and is going to start a war. And and here we go. We're going to possibly could be in a nuclear war because the church doesn't study and listens to buffoons like John Hagee and Michael Brown. Yeah, we would both like to get on our soapbox and talk about that for a good little while tonight. But our time's up. <laughs> right. So, guys, we're going to unpack a little bit more of Romans 13, but we've got a lot more text to go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This promise that Christ would put an end to sin. And what does that mean? And we'll talk about a little bit uh, positional truth, practice. What is, you know, what does this really mean? So stay tuned for next week. Don, I'll see you then. Amen, brother. Good night. Good night. Before my God In the light In the light In the light of life In the light of life In the light of life in the light of life, in the 